is an echo of the 1960 Marshfield High School graduation, including the news from Lake Envy Be Gone, brought to you by a staff of lovely blind ladies and bulky, bulky gentlemen who may look vaguely familiar. A huge thank you to Diane Thrift, who has done an amazing amount of work putting these events together for every reunion. Good to be here in Pirate Land. Just a note to those of you sitting in the back. There are angry ducks. <laughs> brazen beavers as well. Timber! And, and feral bulldogs. <laughs> but not very feral. <laughs> in the area, so if you feel something cold and shaggy kind of snuggling up to you, you may want to take measures. Push up your glasses, turn up your hearing aids, pull up your Depends thong, <laughs> but especially make sure that your walkers are put together in a defensive line behind you. <laughs> Such a delight to be here on the Oregon coast, where the pace of life is easy going and foggy. <laughs> At this time, the Marshfield Marching Band was scheduled to play the March of the Golden Sandies, but we've just been notified that they turned right instead of left on the strip <laughs> and marched to Coquille where exhaustion overcame them and the keg party. So here is the news from Lake NB, Be Gone. It's been a quiet week in Lake NB, Be Gone, but the fog has lifted and we're glad to have our three days of summer right now. Although summer is the hardest season for Lutherans, the summer vacation has been a source of extreme misery and anguish over the years because when we are brought up, we are directed to answer in a non-assertive way, whatever you want. When asked, where do you want to go? Someone finally decides and we spend two weeks on the edge of despair in windy, running, soaked Tillamook eating cheese, but we are better people for it, although a few might have become closet Unitarians. <laughs> we are glad to have this abundance of sunny days, but we are looking for some drizzle to end this drought so we can reminisce about our graduation in the moist style to which we have become accustomed. When the class of 1,960 marched into the auditorium, there were little burps of light as flashbulbs exploded. And Lutherans who hadn't expressed sentiment for years were blubbering. It was like prisoners of war being released from a concentration camp. Prisoners were the parents. <laughs> Graduation night is as close as Lutheran parents ever come to outright passion. Although we suspected that some of the younger teachers at Marshfield, like Mr. Bunyard and Mr. Teese, just might feel a spark of emotion, or at least excitement on, on occasion, one Saturday night, I was parked up on Moonlight Lane, overlooking the picturesque log booms on the mud flats of a slough, whose name has been lost in the foggy recesses of my Swiss cheese mind, with a girl who will never be forgotten, when the lovely history teacher, Miss Morgan, 
of half Hawaiian descent pulled up beside us in a red convertible with a male companion and proceeded to actually kiss him. Now that was news that could not wait. And I put on my dad's old fart Ford into gear and drove my date straight to the Dairy Queen, where we proceeded to spread the word that passion was alive in the older generation and that some teachers might be human after all. As the graduates and their parents settled into the auditorium seats, our much-loved principal, Mr. Schellenbarger, took up his sight by podium. Now, every previous year, the seniors had played some sort of practical joke. So, Mr. Schellenbarger and all the teachers sitting on stage were on the watch, especially Mr. Stiles, who was worried that his car and Isaiah would be run four feet up the flagpole again <laughs> by a gang of senior football players, including Norm Brewer, Roger Hillman, Hank Wendell, Clyde Thrift, Dick Shanley, Jerry Weekly, and Tom Erdman. Rumors had abounded but Mr. Stiles never was about to point out the culprits, as the team was doing so well that the entire town would have turned out to put him up the flag. <laughs> the teaching staff was scanning for bulges in people's pockets or any signs of suspicious activity. When you're around 17 or 18 year olds, everything is suspicious. <laughs> now, Mr. Monks was hoping that Jim Southam, Les Flake, and Stan Kiefer hadn't made another hydrogen sulfide stink bomb. <laughs> For two days, he'd had the whole chemistry class in the lunchroom and listened to the complaints of the lunchroom staff as they accused his students of stealing apples and bananas. They would never know that Mr. Monks had a penchant for forbidden fruits. <laughs> when Mr. Stiles wasn't thinking about his car up a pole, he was terrified that Mike Demick, Bruce Sander, and Steve Fitzwalter had filled his desk with garter snakes one more time. <laughs> In the fall and spring after church, a favorite Sunday afternoon pastime of his students was to go up the Coos River to a wide spot where they swam in the summer to collect cardboard boxes of garter snakes. One on Monday, they would lay the snakes gently on top of Mr. Stiles' current novel in the drawer that he would open after coming to class one minute late. <laughs> then, writing the day's assignment on the blackboard and telling everyone to sit down and shut up and get busy. His screams could be heard in the classes at the far end of the hall. Miss Covey prayed <laughs> that she wouldn't slip on another of Jack Hackett's banana peels <laughs> and put her head through the plasterboard wall again. Oh, it In her seat of honor, at the edge of the stage, the beloved 81-year-old study hall substitute Mrs. Sigismund crossed her arthritic fingers in hope 
that next year seniors would not play their transistor radios so loudly that they woke her up <laughs> as she sat at her desk behind the newspaper she had trained herself to hold up for 45 of the 50 minutes of each class. <laughs> then, while our counselor, Mr. Bunyard, was admonishing the graduates to strive for excellence, Mrs. Sigismund's head tilted a bit to the left, and whenever Mr. Bunyard would pause for a moment, the little snorts of her snores were audible as third, far as the third row of the auditorium. <laughs> Mr. Teese silently thanked God that he would never again, during a silent work period in his class, have Ron Sype bump into a girl who was so flustered that she got the words over and up backwards when she meant to say, if you knock me over, you'll have to pick me up. <laughs> Strangely, it was a very calm graduation. As the students reflected on the days before when they had sat in the halls on the lawn and signed each other's yearbooks, that simple action formed a bond which they had not sensed before. A compelling bond that they were incapable of articulating to each other which made it all the more powerful. I feel this still, this bond with classmates, even those I don't really know after all these years. Even now, this bond compels us to see each other as we were, like Lou Devlin standing up in Miss Baker's English class discussing a book he had not read. <laughs> and Bill Starnes agreeing with him <laughs> in very general terms. <laughs> and Mel Counts banging his forehead on yet another door frame <laughs> as he went into home economics class. <laughs> Or Larry Whitmire, Lee Wilcox, Ken Chart, and Keith Smith hanging from the bottoms of the climbing ropes in the gym, praying that Mr. Oliski would finally say, enough. <laughs> uh, or the day that Mr. Riskell got angry with the brass section for making so many mistakes and threw his baton, which got stuck in the bell of Dennis Lee's French horn. <laughs> or the time that I stood at Mr. Martin's blackboard and stared at a math problem I couldn't begin to understand. Or the time Vic Pennyjohn went to homeroom for show and tell with a huge Idaho spud. <laughs> uh, the class made him wish he'd gone to the Unitarians instead. <laughs> or Michael Weathers taking candid photos in the girls' gym. <laughs> For the Ma High Times, he said. <laughs> or Ray Wilson confounded Coach Sussex when he asked Ray why he wasn't turning in a math assignment. And Ray told him he wasn't a member of the class, he was just visiting. <laughs> <laughs> and Dick Bong's almost daily whack from Coach Pozesniak's tickle stick in American <laughs> history. Because he just had to whisper something to somebody. Yes, 
I still feel this bond with my classmates, even though it is staggering for me to see the devastation of time in their faces. Well, I go on being 18 years old. <laughs> Nevertheless, I want to say that this is our tribe. These are our people. And, and we will keep drawing closer to them, if only in our dreams. I am extraordinarily proud of the great accomplishments of our women classmates. Among them, university professors, doctors, public school teachers, leaders of business, world travelers. You probably noticed that their names have not been mentioned in this monologue. <laughs> that is because I am not comfortable with having jokes about women at their expense. <laughs> well, that may sound chauvinistic, and I have ambushed most of the guys, but I am in awe of the intelligent, accomplished women of the class of 16.